Welcome back to CS125. Let's get started. Everybody, please find a seat. This looks like some seats over here. Um, help people that are uh, just arriving find a seat so everyone can sit down. We have 595 people enrolled as of this morning. We have 620 seats in this room. So we're going to have to do this every day. Um, so please log on to the slide deck. Find the slides on the website. Uh, what you're looking for to ensure that you get participation credit is this green checkbox up here. If you don't see that, uh, post on the forum or talk to your TA in office hours, uh, or talk to your TA in lab today, come to office hours tomorrow, and we'll help you get that fixed. Usually it's something with your privacy settings or a plugin that's interfering with this. Uh, for the next two weeks, this is practice. So you will see your lecture participation scores up on the website, but we're not counting them for credit uh, until a week two weeks from last Monday. Um, but this is a good chance to get familiar with the system and make sure that you are going to get credit throughout the rest of the semester. All right, so welcome back. Today we're going to start learning to program. We're going to look at some examples of how to use variables. We're going to talk about types in Java. We'll see how far we get. Uh, if we have a little bit of time at the end, we'll start talking about conditional expressions. Um, so what we're really doing um, together here this semester, I, I just want to... to sort of draw an analogy with learning a new language. So that is, that is what you're doing. You're learning a computer language. And this is a language that allows you to communicate with a computer, to tell a computer what to do. Last time we talked about some of the reasons that you want to do this, because computers are incredibly powerful and good at doing things that you are not as good at. And so they are a great complement to your human abilities. Here's the thing. There's both pros and cons about learning a new computer language. The pros are that the computer is always willing to talk to you. When you learn a new human language, you know, if you're learning French and you're talking to your friend who knows French and you're stumbling around, at some point they're going to get frustrated and be like, I don't want to do this anymore. You know, you don't speak French good. Uh, I want to, you know, talk to somebody who does. The computer will always, is always ready and willing to have a conversation with you. The homework problems that we provide are available all the time. Um, throughout the, once we uh, put out a homework problem, you'll have access to that problem throughout the rest of the semester. You can practice as many times as you want. That's the good thing. The bad thing is that the computer is incredibly literal about things. Um, the computers are not good with nuance when it comes to programming languages. And so tiny, tiny, tiny little mistakes will cause things to go completely wrong. This is something that tends to frustrate people when they start to learn how to program, but I just want you to get used to this because this is normal and this is something that you have to start uh, being familiar with. So let me show you an example. Here's a piece of code. probably looks pretty similar to something that we did last time, something that's on this week's quiz. Okay? Uh, you know, I've got this uh, magic incantation, system.out.println, that we're starting to use that we think is supposed to uh, cause the computer to print something to the console, and then I've got the message that I want to print. This looks pretty good, right? Fortunately, when I try to run this, I get this cryptic error message back from the computer. Something went wrong. This compilation failed, and then there's all this strange information. It, it, you know, it says line three, column zero. I have no idea what's going on. What's the problem here? Who can see this? Squint at this pretty hard. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, look at this. Look at this. It's the problem. In Java, the messages that I pass to this function need to be enclosed in double quotes not single quotes. And so this tiny, tiny little mistake is the difference between success and failure. This is going to come back to haunt you. Trust me. I hear from students every semester. It's like, oh, I went to the CBTF to take my quiz, and I was so close to getting it right. And sometimes when we look at the problem together, it turns out I definitely had cases last semester where students came in, and there was literally one character we had to change. There was the difference between them receiving credit on the problem and not receiving credit on the problem. So you're going to have to learn how to look at these things carefully. After a while, you will get good at this. Your eyes will get good at it. Your brain will get good at it. You will start to be able to read code very carefully. Right now, a lot of you maybe didn't even see that. But you will. You'll learn this. But as we're going along, just keep in mind that these tiny, tiny, small mistakes are big problems to the computer. So again. Good thing about learning a new language with a computer, it's always willing to practice. Bad thing, it's incredibly literal. Small mistakes 
Uh, it doesn't do small mistakes. It doesn't do nuance. All right. So let me talk about how we're going to do this this semester in terms of how we're going to teach you how to program. That's one of the things we're doing this semester and something we're going to focus on pretty heavily for the next couple of weeks is bringing you up to speed as quickly as we can on the basics of imperative programming so that we can ta start to talk about more interesting things. Some of the stuff, when we get started, is dry, not particularly interesting. But trust me, it gets better, it gets more interesting, it gets more exciting, it gets more fun. Just have to get to the basics for a couple of weeks. So hang on, we're going to go as fast as we possibly can and then give you lots and lots of time throughout the rest of the semester to practice. OK, so sort of like learning a human language, we're going to start by looking at small pieces of code. We're going to look at a lot of code in this class together, particularly in lecture. Um, and you know, when we help you with the homework problems, we help you with the MPs, we're going to be looking at a lot of code. When we start off for the for next couple days, next couple weeks, we're going to be looking at really small examples. This is sort of how you learned a human language. Remember the you know, see Jane Run book or whatever? I mean, small sentences, small examples, that's how you get started. We'll look at them, we'll understand them together, um, and then we'll start to build up to slightly more complicated things. So once you start to understand sentences in Java, we'll start looking at paragraphs, and eventually we'll give you entire blocks of text. To look at. Then the complicated start writing functions together, then implement algorithms. Um, our goal by the end of the semester, and it's going to take us time to get there, this is, you know, again, kind of similar to learning a human language. You don't come in and suddenly learn how to read Spanish in two weeks. Um, but what we're go our goal is, by the end of the semester, you guys can sit down with a piece of Java source code and understand pretty much every line. Now, this is sort of, again, like learning a human language, where sometimes, you know, once you learn, even, even when you learn no English, when you think you know English, sometimes you sit down with a complicated piece of text, and it might take you a little while to work out every part. Oh. oh, daddy, don't do that. All right. So it might take you a little while to, to figure out what's going on as you go through longer pieces of source code, right? Uh, but, but we'll get there. That's our goal. Okay. So we're going to start off, remember we talked about five things last time that computers were good at. Basic math, simple decision making, repeating things over and over, storing data, and communicating. So we're going to start off today talking about two of those things, storing data and manipulating data using basic, basic mathematical operators. And we'll see why we're going to look at basic math in a minute, because the data that we're going to start looking at is numerical. OK, so let's look at some Java code together. Here's a snippet of Java code. And this is how you declare a variable in Java. A variable, like its name implies, is something whose value can change. Um, it allows you to name a piece of data. That data, the contents of that data can change over time. And a lot of what we do when we write programs is we write code that modifies the value of a variable as the program runs. Now in Java, when you declare a variable, you're telling Java that you want to be able to manipulate a certain piece of data, you want to call it something, and then you also have to provide something called a type. For some of you that learned Python or other programming languages before, this may be a new thing. So let's talk about how we interpret some of this code. And one of the things we'll do together for the first couple weeks is sometimes we'll just sort of read things out loud to get a sense of how this particular piece of source code translates into English. So on line two, what I'm doing is I'm declaring a variable named C of type car. And we'll come back and talk about what these types mean in a few minutes. On line five, what I'm telling Java is that I'm going to use a variable called first, and I'm going to use that variable to store ints. That's a variable of type int. On line seven, I'm saying I'm, going to, I'm creating a variable called isSet, and that variable is going to store Boolean values. These are truth values, true or false. Okay, so here's our, our first little bits of Java code. Before I set or modify the value of a variable, I have to tell Java that I'm going to use that variable to do something. And so this is sort of the first step when we start storing and manipulating data. We need human names that we're going to use to refer to pieces of data that can change as the program runs. That's what a variable is. So in Java, every variable has both a name and a type. 
The name is really for you. Java doesn't care what you call your variables. Now, writing good, readable, maintainable, debuggable code, choosing good variable names will help with that a lot. So what you call your variables matters quite a bit. One of the things I see people doing who didn't take CS125 um, and who aren't very good programmers is they use terrible variable names, and that makes their code very hard to understand. So we'll see some examples of this in a few minutes. When you name variables, typically you want to choose a name that indicates something about the role the variable is playing in your program. But we'll come back and talk about that, and that'll make more sense as we go along. The type is used by Java. And the reason that Java requires that you provide a type for variables is so it can help you manipulate those variables correctly. So if you create a variable of a particular type, let's say you say, okay, Java, I'm gonna use this variable to store numbers and then you try to put a truth value or a character into that variable, Java's gonna stop you and say, hey, wait, hold on. That's not what you said you were gonna do with this variable. You said this variable is gonna store numbers. Now you're trying to store a Boolean value into it. That's not okay. Again, if you came from languages like Python, this is different. Um, Java is a type safe language. It forces you to declare the kind of data that's gonna be stored in a particular variable and then stick to that declaration over time. So we'll see some examples of this in a minute. In general, variable names have to be unique. That kind of makes sense, right? Because when you're writing code and you say, I'm gonna do something with a particular variable, in this case, C, Java needs to know which variable you're talking about. So this doesn't work. Um, so on line two, I'm saying, hey Java, I'm gonna use a variable uh, called C that's of type character. But then on line five, I'm like changing my mind. I'm like, oh no, wait, hold on. That variable needs to store uh, type things of type int. This is not okay. There are more complicated rules about how variable names and where variable names need to be unique, but those aren't gonna really make sense to us until we talk about some other things. So we're gonna come back and talk about this again later. All right, so again, choosing good variable names can make your life a lot easier as a programmer. This is not something that's gonna make a lot of sense now, but I think it's something that bears repeating. Good variable names describe something about the, what the role the variable plays in your program um, and are indicative of the variable's function. However, when possible, keep them as short as possible. Um, so those goals are not always completely, um, sometimes those goals are somewhat orthogonal, right? But in general, when you're writing good maintainable code, choosing variable names that tell you, that remind you something about what you were doing with that variable in your code is really helpful. Again, I don't expect this to make a lot of sense. I'm saying it to plant a seed in your brains that will hopefully uh, sprout and germinate later, and we will repeat this advice over and over again. Okay. So, here, and here's an example of good variable naming. When we give you code in this class, my goal is always to have that code be high quality code, examples of what I would expect you to do, right? So this is uh, an example from a solution set from an MP that we did a couple years ago. And if you look at this code and squint at it a little bit, you can actually tell a little bit about what's going on here, uh, even if you don't know how to program at all, right? Like for example, what is this variable, what is this variable doing in the program? It's storing some information about a maximum of some kind, right? And if you saw the whole uh, piece of the whole function here, it would make more sense in context, but these are good reminders. Okay. Next piece of Java syntax we're gonna look at are comments. And I just want you to understand how these work. These are tremendously important. So on line one and two, I see an example of something called a single line comment in Java. It starts with two forward slashes, the slashes that are leaning forward. Comments are ignored by Java. Wait, hold on, go back. Um, ah, so there it is. Comments are ignored by Java, but that doesn't mean that they're not useful. They're there for you, the programmer, as a reminder of what a particular part of your code is doing. So Java doesn't care what is inside your comments, right? Here's an example of a multi-line comment. Uh, you start it with um, a forward slash and an asterisk, and then you end it with an asterisk followed by a forward slash. Anything inside these comments is completely ignored by Java when it runs your code. But again, you can put you know, a description of what's going on, you can put a question about what happens to this particular line of code or whatever, right? Uh, so these are tremendously useful for you, the developer, as you go along. And you will see them in our examples, right? So for example, 
go back here and look at our um, example. All of these descriptions of what's happening are single line comments. They start with that two, uh, the two forward slash. Okay, great. So, let's talk a little bit more about variable types in Java. So Java is what's called an object-oriented programming language, and we will talk lots more about objects later in the class. But Java also allows, and, and so a lot of data in Java is stored as objects. But Java also allows you to store eight types of data in what are called primitive types. So these are building blocks to build up more complicated uh, you know, ways to represent data. A lot of objects eventually, so if I take any piece of data in Java, I can always break it down to one or more of these primitive types. So the eight primitive types, there are four different types of integer. These are whole number values, right? 0, 1, 10, 22. No fractional component. There are four different integer types in Java. Byte, short, int, and long. The one you see most often is int, but there are three others. And we're going to talk in a minute about why are there so many. The second category of primitive types are what are called floating point numbers. So Java also allows me to store data that has a decimal component. So 10.5, 82.6, you know, 72.3333, whatever. There are two different types in Java that we use to store floating point values. One is called float. Second is called double. Double is the one that you see more commonly. All right, there are, so we're up to six. So you've got two more primitive types. The seventh is character, car. This stores a character value. What is that? It's a single letter. It's not multiple letters. Java will refer to that as a string. It's a single letter. And finally, truth values, which Java type we use, Boolean. So a Boolean can only store two different values. A Boolean is either true or false. Okay, so these are my eight primitive types in Java. I have four integer types, byte, short, int, and long, two floating point types, float and double, a type that stores single letters called car, and then a type that can only store truth values, whether something is true or false. Right? So these types, with these eight primitive types, you might think, you know, uh, going back and looking at this list, you might be like, wait, you told me we were going to manipulate images and work with audio and uh, work with text. Like, I don't see any way in Java to store a sound file, to manipulate a video. How do I even store that information? So turns out, that if you were able to look deep into the memory of a computer as it ran, what you would find is that everything there is represented as numbers. A computer has to, in order to manipulate information, we first have to represent it in a computer as a number or usually as a series of numbers. And so it turns out that by using these primitive types, and again, usually we don't use one, usually we use a bunch of them. So, for example, a audio file is really just a series of numbers. A video file, really just a series of numbers. Anything that a computer works with has to be represented numerically. How we do that is something that we'll talk about a little bit in a minute and more as the class goes on. That anything that is stored in a computer's memory is eventually represented as a series of numbers. Again, if you could peer in there, that's what you would find. And so it turns out that by building up more complicated data structures and ways to represent data, even from these very, very simple building blocks, we can pretty much manipulate anything that we want. All right. Usually, when we're using a variable, um, we will start it off initialized to some value. So this is our second piece of syntax. We looked at how to initialize a variable by giving it a type and a name. But frequently, what we're going to do is we're also going to uh, give it a value when we initialize it. And the value is on the right side of this expression, separated from the initialization by an equal sign. So on line three, what I'm doing is I'm saying, hey, Java, I want to create a float value 
called mine. That's how I'm going to refer to it in my program. And I'm going to initialize it to the value 0 0.1. On line 7, I'm creating a Boolean that's going to store true or false values. And I'm going to initialize it to false. I'm going to call it, is it snowing? And I'm going to initialize it to false. So the initial value it takes is false. On line 11, I'm telling Java I'm creating a variable of type long with the name time since 1979, and I'm initializing it to this large numerical value. So this looks, the left side of this expression looks very much like the way that we declared a variable. The right side is new. Now one thing, I'm, we'll come back and talk about this in a minute, but one thing I want to warn you about, some of you that, how many people here took algebra at some point? I think all of you, okay? So I was trying to remember things from algebra. I took algebra like in seventh grade. Um, I remember it was really exciting to take algebra because it was like cool. Um, but I was trying to remember like, what did you do in math before algebra? I guess it was just like a bunch of word problems or something. But um, anyway, if you've taken algebra, you probably got used to certain syntax around the symbol equals. Programming languages violate that syntax dramatic, right? So um, this symbol is now an assignment operator. What does that mean? It means that it's going to take the right side of this expression, which is a literal false value, and it's going to assign it to the left side. So what I'm really doing here is I'm saying I'm declaring a variable called is it snowing of type boolean, and then I'm assigning, using the equals operator, the value false to that variable as it's declared. We're going to see the assignment operator again in a minute. But again, if you're used to equals indicating equality, you will have to get young used to that being the case. Because programming languages use this to modify and assign values to variables, particularly Java. Other languages have different syntax, but it's this is a pretty common thing. I realized as I was thinking about this that I've been programming so long that I've totally forgot, I probably couldn't do algebra anymore because this symbol doesn't mean the same thing to me anymore. It just means assignment rather than equality. All right, so let's mess around a little bit with this. So the, when you guys get to a, a slide that looks like this, this is a code snippet that you can edit and run at your own seat. So I would encourage you as we mess around with stuff to do that. You know, go ahead, you know, try to run the example in front of you, make some changes to it as I go along. Um, it, you know, this is, this is why this is built this way, for you guys to experiment uh, during lecture. All right, so here I'm declaring a variable of type double, and then I'm going to try to print it. This is not going to work. Let's try running it. Um, the reason is that, well, why do you think this is? Who has a hypothesis about this? Yeah. Is that for me? Sorry. Yeah, I haven't told Java what value this variable is supposed to have. And so before I can uh, print the value of a variable, I need to assign it to something. So let's try to assign it to 2. And now I see that it prints off OK. Right? Um, this value stores floating point uh, numbers. Let's try putting an integer into it. That seems to work OK. When it's printed, so this is interesting, I'm assigning it something that looks like an integer, but when it's printed, it's printing off with a decimal point. So that's kind of interesting to note. Um, let's try a different type of variable here. Let's create a character. Um, and let's try initializing that. So here's another example, and I'm going to have to change my print statement to print this letter value. That also seems to work. A common stumbling block in Java that I will show you right here um, is when I initialize a character, I cannot put that character in double quotes. That will not work. Why is this the case? I don't know. Complain to whoever designed Java. But when I use a character literal, it has to be in single quotes. As long as I put it in single quotes, I'm okay. If I put it in double quotes, what I'm actually doing is creating a string. We will talk about those soon. 
All right, let's try one of the other, uh, let's try a long. Um, let's try an int. Let's use, let's initialize this to 1024. And then let's print it. That seems to work. Okay. Questions about this before we go on? Basic building blocks of how we store data in Java. Yeah. Ah, good question. So the question is, what if I try this? What do we think is going to happen? Yeah. So when Java runs your code, it runs it starting at the first line, moving on to the second line, moving on to the third line. So when we run your code, we run it from top to bottom. Normally. We'll talk later about how things can jump around. But normally, if there's not, you know, something else going on, there's not another type of uh, what we call control statement that I'm using, I, I execute lines in order. So what happens here is I start with line two. Line one is a comment. I start with line two. And Java says, wait, you're trying to use this variable called number, and you've never declared this variable before. So I have no idea what this is, right? And, and in this case, the error message that I'm seeing is actually pretty helpful. It says unknown variable or type number. Good question. Yeah, in the back. What does the semicolon do? Great question. So in Java, each statement, we end with a semicolon, right? That, that tells the compiler that tells Java that I'm done with this particular state, right? I can actually do things like this. Please don't do this. Well, here, let's, let's do it in the right way. That will work. Do not do this. I'm only going to leave this up on the slide for a quarter of a second. When you write code for this class, and our tools will check for this, every semicolon uh, then ends a statement should cause you to start a new line. Yeah. Ah, okay. Somebody has, someone has uh, tried this. That's weird. We're going to get there. Give me a couple slides. Yeah. All right, good. One of the things we've just been doing that I want to point out is we've been using something called a literal. Just want to make sure you understand the syntax and what this is. So a literal is, uh, in contrast to a variable, a variable's value can change as the program runs. A literal, on the other hand, is a literal value of that type. So for example, this is a character literal. This is a character variable. So on the left side of line five, I'm saying I'm, I'm declaring a variable called one of type car. On the right side, I'm initializing it to a literal character. Same thing down here. These are my Boolean literals, true and false. Up here, I'm using um, a long literal. Now, there's a couple of uh, places in Java where I need to use a little bit of a special syntax, particularly when I'm using integers. So the L at the end tells Java that this is a long integer. If I leave that off, it's an int rather than a law. But these, these, you will see these values in your code. There are places where you need to use a literal number, like one or two or a thousand, or a literal character, or in, uh, we'll talk about a little bit, a literal string. Right? So this is something that you can do. Yes? Uh, if you leave off the L, I don't think this will actually work. Right? Yeah, that's a good question. Other questions? I saw somebody else with a hand up. Yeah. No, the, the literal is the thing that I'm setting it to. Yeah. So the literal is this. This is a long literal. This statement is an assignment, right? No, the value is called a literal. Yes, exactly. So this is, this is a literal. This is a literal. True and false are examples of Boolean literals. That's a great question. The line is an assignment and a declaration. So that what I'm doing is I'm declaring a variable called I slept well. This is my type, Boolean. This is the assignment operator, and this is D. 
the literal that I'm initializing it to. Yes, in the back. Yeah. If you leave off the L, it's an int literal. Yeah. So ints is, it, int is the most common uh, integer data type in Java, and so to declare an int, I don't need the long. Yeah. Nope, so this is a long literal on the right. It's a long variable. Yep. So that, that statement probably won't compile. Right, because what it, yeah, because because Java is going to say you declared a variable of long, but you're assigning it to an int, right? Actually, that's a great that's a great point. Let me let me get there. Um, yeah. So what happens generally if I try to change the type of a variable, right? So here's an example. On line two, I've created an integer variable called changing, and I've set it to the literal ten. Then on line three, I try to assign it to a a, a literal that's a floating value. It has a decimal point, right? So this is a double literal. What's going to happen if I try to do this? Java's going to complain. It says, I can't convert a double to an integer. Why not? I mean, why won't Java just do this? I mean, in this case, what could I do? I'm on line three, I'm assigning this, uh, like, what's one way you could do this? Yeah. Well, uh, casting just forces Java to do something, but what, what, what do I have to do here? So I could change the type to float, right? But I'm saying, what can I do here? I've got an integer variable, and I'm taking a floating point value, and I'm trying to put the floating point value into the integer variable. So what, how, what do I need to do in order to do this? Yeah, I've got to lose the decimal point. So here, you might say that's okay, there's nothing after the decimal point. But what if I had a value like this? Should that be 11? Should it be 10? And so in general, what you'll find is that Java will not do this if it's forced to destroy information. We never want to destroy data. So what Java is saying is, hey, this literal has a floating, has a decimal component of 0.5. If I assign it to an integer, I'm going to have to lose that component. So I won't do this. Here's what's going to confuse you. That will work. Why? What's different about it? Yeah. Bingo. Yeah, so here, my variable changing is of type double. So it's already prepared to store a fractional component, and when I initialize it, I set it to the double literal 10.5. Then on line three, I change its value to the integer literal 10. Why is that okay? Because I don't have to lose any information when I convert it to a double. I just add on an empty floating point component. Yeah, so this is, this is something that people will probably notice and ask about. So it's good to, good to talk about. Okay, let's back up for a second and talk about how we modify variables. So once I've declared a variable and initialized it, I can change the value. Again, this is different than algebra. We are not in algebra anymore. Um, in algebra, you can't do this. It's like if changing is 10, then that is what it is. That it, it's equal to 10, it can never change. Here, on line three, what am I doing? I'm using the assignment operator to say, I'm now going to change the value of changing to 20. I can also have an expression on the right side of the assignment operator, so I can do math over here. What's the value of changing going to be after I execute line four? What do you guys think? What am I doing here? I'm evalu let's evaluate the right side. What's 20 plus 10? 30. I assign it to changing. So what's the value of changing now? 30. Yeah. See what happens if I run this? Good. The laws of the universe are still holding. I have some special operators that I can use here um, that you guys will find quite frequently quite useful. So what do you think this does? 
Somebody who hasn't answered a question yet today. Yeah. Adds one. Yeah. So this says this is equivalent to. That's the same thing. This is a shorthand because this is a really frequently used operator. So frequently I take a variable and I want to add something to it. What about on line seven? What do you think there? Yeah. Divides by two. Yeah. So this is the same thing as saying changing is equal to changing divided by two. So let's look at what my result is now. I need to be able to type. Yep. Okay, so this is this is also a little strange. Let's let's print off what happens after line six. Okay. So changing with thirty one and I divided it by two and I got fifteen. Why? That seems wrong. I told you computers could do math. Apparently they don't do it very well. Yeah. I assigned it to an int. Yeah. So when I do integer arithmetic, what happens is the floating point part gets dropped. I want to be clear about that. It is not rounded. It is just removed. So even if this had, uh, even if the math had come out to 15.9999999999, it does not come out to 16. What happens when I do math and in integers is I just remove any fractional component when I do division. Okay, good. So we saw this about type. Um, so let's do something a little more complicated. When I assign a value to a variable, I can use the value of other variables. So here, what am I doing on line one? I'm declaring a variable of type double, named first, I'm sending it to 10. On line two, I'm declaring a variable of type double, named second, and I'm sending it to five. Now again, if, you, if you're coming from algebra, you might feel like line three might really offend you. Because clearly this is impossible. This is not true. I just said, said that first was 10 and second was five. First can't equal second. It's just false. But this is not equality. This is assignment. So what happens? I'm setting the value of first to whatever the value of second is. So if I print off first after line three, what do you guys think I'm going to see? Five. I've modified the value of first. Now I change the value of second. Now here's something that's important to understand. What's the value of first going to be now? How many people think 20? Because I set first equal to second, and then I set second to 20. So first should now be equal to 20, right? No, oh, you guys are good. When I assign primitive values in Java, I copy the value of the variable over at that point in time. So after line three runs, first it's equal to five, because that's what the value of second was at that time. If I change the value of second later, the value of first does not change. The value of second changes, the value of first does not. I can do math on the right side using variables here. I'm setting first equal to second plus 10. Um, and I can also declare new variables as I'm going along. So now I have a variable called third, and now I'm setting first equal to second plus third. Okay, good. Again, I want to just point out one more time, just for fun, because this is kind of fun, that this is not algebra. So again, line two is impossible. It doesn't even matter what the variable of z is. If you got this on the ACT, it would be like false or whatever. You know, z can't be equal to z plus one. It makes no sense. This is not equality. This is assignment. So how does the statement get evaluated? Java evaluates the right side of it says z was 10, z plus 1 is 11, and I ch use that to change the value of z. So when this is done, z is going to be equal to 11. One thing to be careful about as well is that this is not, particularly with assignment, you have to be careful about the direction in which you think about how a statement is executed. It's not English. English, we read from left to right. When I read an assignment statement, it's really more helpful to read from right to left, because that's actually how the computer executes the statement. The first thing the computer does is it evaluates the right side of this assignment expression. So in this case, it's going to say, okay, 
You told me that you were gonna use a variable called first. That's a double. The value of first at this point is 10. So I've got 10, and then I'm gonna add second. You told me you were gonna use a variable named second on line three. Second has value five at this point, so that's five. So I've got 15. I add 10 to it, I've got 25. Okay, so I'm done executing the right side. I figured out what I should assign this to, and then I move it to the left. So really what I do when I do assignment is I start on the right, I evaluate everything past the equal sign, and then I use it to assign whatever's on the left side. So when I'm done, first, this variable that I declared on and initialized on line two is now equal to 25. All right. So let's talk a little bit about the primitive types before we wrap up today. So what makes these types primitive? What's, what's something that you might have noticed about all of those types that relates to something I told you about computers 20 minutes ago? All the primitive types in Java have something in common. Yeah. So that's true, we can use them to build up more complicated objects, but why are these the building blocks? What's, what's interesting and, and sort of um, worth pointing out about all of these primitive types? They are numbers. They can be represented as a single number. We're gonna talk about arrays later, which are a bunch of numbers, you know, um, living together, but the primitive types so far that we've seen can all be represented by a single number. But you might be wondering, so, so how do I represent a Boolean value as a number? In my code, I use true and false, but what can I do internally? Zero and one, right? One is typically true, zero is typically, yeah, there's something comforting about that. Um, all right, what about car, though? Car is the one that we're confused about. We saw before that it can be represented as a number, because I can actually take a character literal and assign it to a numeric type, which is weird. Why? This is why. Anyone know what this is? This is the convention that we human beings have agreed upon about how to map characters to numbers. This is the ASCII table. So at some point, I don't know when this happened, I should know, I don't know, 50s, 60s probably, when people were starting to work with computers, Someone realized, you know what, we need to have an agreement about what number is equal to each character. And so they came up with this. Is this connected to any, any fundamental feature of the universe? Is this like a universal law? Like if we find another planet in some other solar system that has intelligent life on it, are they gonna have the same table? No, this is just, we just made this up. This is just what we call in computer science a convention. This is an agreement about how to represent something. So for example, we've just all agreed that the number 118 is going to be used to refer to the character small v. What's wrong with this, though? Many of you may be looking at this. Many of you may not have grown up in this country. Many of you may notice something about this table. What's missing from the table? Like every other language on earth, right? Chinese characters, Japanese characters, you know, Hindi characters, whatever, right? And so actually what we've done is now we have a more uh, complete agreement called Unicode that I couldn't show you because the, t like the font would be zero size because it can be used to represent everything. So Unicode allows us to even represent emoji. I can do upside down characters. Um, I actually read something that apparently um, that if you look at the Japanese characters that I can represent in Unicode, I can represent every single Japanese character that's actually in use. But there's also some characters in there that nobody knows how they got in there because they're not real Japanese characters. There's like four of them that apparently Japanese scholars are like, that's not a real character, you know? Like imagine if this was English and there was like something in here between V and W where you're like, I've never seen that letter before, right? Anyway, but that's okay, because Unicode allows us to represent lots and lots of different characters. So again, there's no law of the universe that says that we use a particular number to represent A, 
it's just something that we've all agreed on. Last few uh, notes about types. So you notice that we have multiple ways of representing integers and multiple ways of representing floating point numbers. This seems weird. Why? I've got four different ways to represent integers, four different types that I can use to store an integer value. Why is that? Anybody know? The reason for this is that the different types allow me to store different ranges of values. And they take up different amounts of space in your computer's memory. So again, this is not something that we want to be super worried about yet, but it is important to understand what the limits are. Because again, here I'm gonna give you another example of how computers can do math, okay? Brilliant. On line one, I declare a value of type byte called smallest, and I set it to 10, and then I add 256 to it. What should this print? 266. Again, I told you the two computers could do math. What's going on here? Yeah. Oh, you're close. Yeah. Right, so a byte in Java can only store the numbers zero to 255. It can't store smaller numbers, it can't store bigger numbers. Actually, sorry, it stores from negative 128 to 127. 256 values. So when I add 256 to it, what actually happens is I start at 10, I start counting up. When I get to 128, I wrap around to negative 127, and then by the time I've added 256 values, I get back to 10. So again, this is not something to concern yourself with yet, but understand that in certain cases, this can happen. Any finite amount of computer memory can only store so many values. So this is something to be aware of when you're doing math with the computer. I wanna point you to documentation that Oracle maintains about the primitive types. This is something that's really useful as you're programming, particularly if you're thinking about this. It's not something that we're gonna work on very much this semester, but this stuff's available. Okay. So I'm gonna come back and start up here next time. I have a couple of important announcements today, so please stay put. So tomorrow is gonna be the first meeting of our CS199 Even More Practice session. This is held weekly, Thursdays, 5 to 7 p.m., or 5 to 6 p.m., 6.30, uh, in SIBO 0216. You do not need to sign up for this to, in order to show up. If you want to sign up and get one hour of ungraded credit, that's fine. If you don't show up, if you're confused about the material that week, please come to EMP. So what we do in this section is um, one of the TAs, Anjali, is gonna review the material with you. So this is a chance to ask more questions about stuff that we covered in lecture, to do more practice problems, and generally get help with whatever we talked about in class that week. After I'm done lecturing from now until May, I need to get out of here. Um, I'm here, you know, I'm, I'm gonna be on this stage until 10.50, because we have a lot to talk about and I'm super pumped about it. But once I am done, I need to escape from this room. And so please, this is not a good time to talk to me. I will hang out outside and I've got office hours that I'm gonna have pretty much every week. So those are good times to talk to me, but please don't be offended if you come down and ask me a question and I'm trying to get my stuff together. If I don't focus, I tend to forget things. Okay, announcements for today. I've got office hours at 11 to 1 p.m. in my office. We have a homework problem out today. Friday, we're gonna continue talking about the basics of imperative programming. Labs continue today. Please take the quiz in the CBTF. Office hours start tomorrow, and I will see you all on Friday.